Welcome back to Pentagram Prime, everyone. Today, we will be looking at the real improper integral of 1 over 1 plus x to the 6th from 0 to infinity. Unfortunately, there is no obviously available antiderivative for this integral. I mean, there might be if I only wanted to bother looking. There may actually be a way to do this via substitution, but I got exercise 4 from page 301 of the complex analysis text, so I'll try to do something that involves the letter i. Condition number 2 in table 4.3.1 on page 296 of Marsden and Hoffman tells us that if our integrand is made up of the quotient of two polynomials p and q, and the degree of q is greater than or equal to that of p plus 2, then we can utilize residue theorem to evaluate the integral. This method of evaluation assumes integration across a domain from minus to positive infinity. However, 1 over 1 plus x to the 6th is an even function. So the answer that we are looking for will be half that of the integral fitting the form listed in part 2 from table 431. For our purposes, p of x will be 1 and q of x will be 1 plus x to the 6th. Part 2 from table 431 requires us to locate all of the residues in the upper half of the complex plane, and it is important to note that no singularities are permitted on the real axes when using this methodology. Singularities only seem to be present when the denominator q becomes 0. The function q can be factored algebraically, but it's more straightforward, at least for now, for us to rearrange the equation so that x to the 6th equals minus 1. The variable z makes more sense than x at this juncture, and we must recognize that minus 1 is equal to e raised to the i times pi. I've looked a couple of times for the name of whatever this formula is for the nth root of a complex number. It is not de Morve's formula. This is the opposite of that. And it probably is the name of somebody from antiquity. If we place our expression for z to the 6th in cis form with a value of r equals 1, then we can use the radian version of the formula to find the values of the roots. Inserting 6 for the value of n and pi for theta, we now have a formula that provides us with 6 values of alpha and therefore z corresponding to k values 0 through n minus 1, or 0 through 5. These values are evenly spaced about the unit circle and show us where p over q has its singularities in the complex plane. Of the six possible values of z given by k values 0 through 5, there are three whose residues are of interest to us. The values of z corresponding to alphas pi over 6, pi over 2, and 5 pi over 6 all lie in the upper half of the complex plane, and we can't completely ignore the other values because we need to be sure that none of these fall on the real axes per the requirements of the aforementioned method 2 in table 4.31. Plotting the points, all of which fall on the unit circle, shows that nothing touches the real axes and we can now focus on the upper half of the plane. e to the i pi over 2 is located on the imaginary axes and can be seen to break down as 0 plus i times 1. A little bit of trigonometry shows us that the other two points align with the proportions of 30, 60, 90 triangles, and this allows us to make quick work of breaking down their respective real and imaginary components. Since I know you all wanted me to factor 1 plus x to the 6th, it's actually z, algebraically, let me do it now so that we can be fully aware of the order of each of the six roots of q of z, formerly q of x, also, we really need to do this in order to properly select the methodology for calculating residues of p of z over q of z later on. So, 1 plus z to the 6th equals 1 to the 6th plus z to the 6th. Then we break the respective exponents into cubic expressions, and from here, it helps if you know the sum of the cubes formula. 1 plus z squared breaks down with first order roots at plus and minus i. And finally, we treat z squared as a separate variable as we apply quadratic formula to a term that, if set equal to 0, can be referred to as a, quote, biquadratic equation, unquote. The two remaining perfect squares break down into four separate first-order terms. We now have shown that the function q of z has six unique first-order roots, and it should all be cake and ice cream from here. Unfortunately, this is actually where the real pain in producing this episode began. 
because when I went to work in this radical, I felt like John Luke Picard in that one episode of Next Gen Star Trek where he screams. When he actually believed he was seeing five lights after a lengthy gaslighting session at the hands of the Kardashians. I actually had two problems that I was wrestling with. First of all, I couldn't manipulate this thing algebraically. I kind of thought that I should be able to, and I tried one multiplicative factor after another, and eventually felt like a fool for having spent so much time on the matter. Second, I seemed to be getting answers that were impossible. I knew what evaluation of the square root was supposed to look like because I had already solved for the location of the zeros in the complex plane. But at this point, I couldn't believe my own answer because if you had asked me, I would tell you and that it's impossible for a square root to equal itself under the circumstances, and then I was on Wolfram Alpha, and it's telling me that there are five lights, and I'm screaming four, and then I see the location of the eye, and I realized that I had been seeing this, but that I thought I was seeing this, and then the guards came and escorted me back to the Enterprise. In addition to a healthy sleep schedule, difficulties like this can be avoided by having friends who can reliably check your work. Moving on. I would ultimately verify the values of both radicals. As mentioned, I briefly thought to do this algebraically, but I'm fairly certain that's a dead end and that both trigonometry as well as the complex plane need to be employed in this problem. So for the radical of 1 plus i root 3 quantity divided by 2, we start by separating the real and imaginary components before recognizing that they correspond to sine and cosine values for pi over 3 radians. Next. We use Euler's relation to convert the expression inside of the radical into an exponential before we drop the radical altogether in favor of encapsulating the entire expression inside of an ex exponent of one half. We also explicitly state that the result can either have a plus or a minus in front of it and still be true. 3 times 2 equals 6 in the denominator of the exponent, and from here on out we will separate the plus and minus versions of our answer. Minus 1 can be expressed as a location on the unit circle located at pi radians off of the x-axis, and we insert as necessary. Combining the exponents in the second of our two answers yields 7 pi over 6, and we then use Euler's relation to convert back into CIS format. Do some trigonometry, look at a 30-60-90 triangle if you need to, and you have yourself a simplified expression that can be inserted for two of the first order zeros in Q of Z. Here is what I did for the radical of 1 minus i root 3 quantity over 2. I'll let those of you who need an in-depth explanation of that process come and find me in the comments. It still involves ratios from 30, 60, 90 triangles as well as Euler's relation. But in this case, you're working upon different locations on the unit circle. Procedures are otherwise nearly identical to what I did for the previous expression. So, just to recap, we're trying to solve a real improper integral via a method that requires us to break the integrand down into functions p and q for the numerator and denominator respectively. In some cases, we're evaluating them using real and complex values, which is why I sometimes use z and other times use x for the function's argument. Now that we've factored q of z, we can look into evaluating the required residues. Since all of the singularities that we are dealing with are simple poles, as evidenced by the first order zeros in the denominator q and the fact that p is non-zero for all values of z in the complex plane, Proposition 412 on page 244 should be a good fit for our purposes. Its use is specific to singular points of the first order. Also, be aware that the derivative of h of z must be non-zero at that singular point. Proposition 412 asks that we separate the function whose residue we seek into g of z on top and h of z in the denominator before evaluating the first derivative of h of z. The expression g of z0 divided by h prime of z0 gives us the residue. p of z is 1 for all z in the complex plane now and forever, so we can agree that it fits the requirements on page 244 regarding the non-zero status of the function g of z in the context of function f of z at all points, singular or otherwise. That fact, combined with the first-order nature of all the singularities in q of z, 
which here is the same as h of z, means that we can use proposition 412 for evaluation of the required residues. Utilizing the original form of q of z, we find that h prime of z works out to 6z to the fifth plus nothing. 6z to the fifth fits nicely into the denominator of the residue formula in prop 412, and now we just need to crunch out the three residues that we care about before summing them. The algebra can get a little messy here depending upon how you attack the problem. I do not recommend looking for a common denominator for the three terms. First things first, we move the factor of 6 in the denominator outside of the brackets. Next, we augment the exponents in each of the complex numbers with a minus sign which moves them from the denominator up to the respective numerators. From here, we focus on the terms that contain angles 5 pi over 6 and 25 pi over 6 and use Euler's relation to separate them into real and imaginary components. I can hear someone on the internet yelling about 5 pi over 2 right now. We will get to it shortly. Those of you who have taken notice of my obsession with 30, 60, 90 triangles probably know where I'm going at this point. For everyone else, I have prepared this graph on the right. It makes it a little easier to see how the sine and cosine values break down. The behavior of the vectors at these two locations allows for some terms to cancel, while other terms may be combined. The result is a remaining term equal to negative i. Now we can focus on e to the negative i times 5 pi over 2 and use Euler's relation to expand it with sine and cosine functions. Since minus 5 pi over 2 lies on the negative imaginary axes, the result is entirely imaginary and leaves us with i pi over 6 times negative i minus i. After some arithmetic and evaluation of an i squared term, we get pi over 3 as the value of the improper integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared from 0 to infinity. A little bit of common sense goes a long way here. I almost went to bed one night with minus pi over 3 for an answer, and I only went back to search for a mistake after realizing that I was supposed to be integrating a real function that is positive for all x. Thus, if your answer is not both positive and real, then I would think twice about turning it in with the rest of your homework. Till next time, this is Pentagram Prime signing off.